Alright, my name is Cardell Dudley Jr. I'm the founder of Finest Magazine, um, co-host of the Focus TV, also scout for the Jim Couch National Training Showcase. Um, former college player, played at the College of Southern Maryland, you know, signed with Lincoln, um, finished my basketball career at uh, Frostburg, uh, began after that. Uh, internship with Don Magazine that developed into a uh, full fledged writing career. Uh, was still pursuing uh, a chance to go overseas. Got the opportunity getting a pro camp, did well. Got offered a contract uh, for a team called Coca Cola that played in the Philippine Basketball Association. Uh, I was on my way to play overseas and doing a pickup game, got my knee blown out. Uh, you know, so that kind of made me have to pivot in a sense. Uh, my knee wasn't responding. Took a couple years for it to get back to normal, but you know the old saying: um, you know, when we make plans, God laughs. So why I thought it was, uh, you know, depressing and below to everything I thought I was about to do, it actually ended up being a blessing because all the experiences, the up and downs in my basketball career, not playing high school, having to go to JUCO route, getting on the AU team, the open doors for the JUCO route, all those things led to. Uh, me being able to connect with a lot of ball players on a lot of levels, you know what I mean? And when I got in the media game, um, I saw the power behind it. Obviously, you know, we grew up watching, you know, the, the ESPNs and whatnot, but when you're in it, you kind of understand the power, you know, write a good article. A lot of people won't take a look, 
and see what's going on over there. And once I saw that, I took a, I took it serious. You know, I took the responsibility of owning my writing craft and also just being, uh, being, being honest, having integrity with whatever I write about a player, a coach, and um, you know, started that, uh, started, got my full first full feature, wrote in in uh, Bounce Magazine, uh, interview with uh, North Carolina Pro Am Errol Reese. And the um, magazine was sold all over the world, and that jump-started everything. Then Dime decided to go to a more entertainment-type direction instead of just sticking with basketball. Took a year off trying to figure out what I was going to do. A lot of people still hit me up about articles, so I said I might as well start my own for people that don't know. Also major in the graphic design. So they taught us how to do all that, you know, we groomed us, you know, put us to the test while I was hooping, you know what I mean? So, you know, we would have to go out in the city you know talk to local businesses uh do projects for them and stuff like that and um that's how come i was confident i could do it and when one thing my graphic design teacher always told me he said if you own your craft you should always be able to get a job you should always be able because he, he said literally everything is graphic design everything you see is it started with a design so as long as you own your craft you should always be able to make a living so kept that in mind put that in work for myself so i'm on mag and it just took off um First credential was to the Nike Global Challenge a few months after I started, and it's been on ever since. Just building up, putting on players. I was everywhere, man, from high school to street ball, semi-pro, college. Um, took a few years to crack the NBA, but I was cool with that, man. You know, I, that's the highest level. So I was just like, look, let me put in some work for a few years, and we'll see where it goes. And we got to that point. We, you know, we cracked the code, got into the Wizards, which is very tough to do. I think they only credential maybe like 40 reporters a game, 25 at home. Unless it's a big game, they may make an exception. So uh, to be one of, you know, 40 outlets that can get in there at game game by game basis and cover the best players in the world is a blessing. I don't take it for granted, no matter how bad they are and all that. You know what I'm saying? It's just, you know, especially the history of us and media. I'm talking about blacks. Uh, it's 93% white. So we got to handle our business when we get opportunities. We can't mess it up. So... You know, I've been using that, got put on, you know, obviously brought on board a scout for, uh, you know, Jim Couch. Um, you know, it was it was very interesting at first. Uh, you know, some of the powerhouse AAU teams, they didn't even give me a no, let alone answer. So I said, fine, this is a chance for me to prove myself. So what I did was I really had to show I knew what I was doing. So I was scouting and I would get some hidden gems up there and they would go up there and play against the New York kids who had – D1 office, big time office, whatnot, and did work. So that opened a lot of people's eyes. Like, right, this this dude really know what he's doing. He does not get a bunch of names. And I just stuck to that formula and we managed to uh blow it up to this year, man. We had, you know, Gonzaga come up, you know, the first WCAC team come up there, man, which is huge. Uh come up to New York and battle, man. So it's it's been a blessing, man. And uh, you know, obviously. You know, trying to bring it to fruition on a pro level with this Jim Couch DMV team, you know, that they put me in charge of as far as like putting their team together, putting the right pieces together, each something to compete. But the main thing is development, you know, giving these guys a taste of the pros, a real taste, so they can really see if they got what it takes or if they don't. It's just talk, you know what I mean? So, you know, you good year one, uh, eight and two, can ask for a better introduction. Felt made it to the championship, failed by two points, staying still, uh, but. Looking forward to trying to write the ship. You know, feel like we left the championship on the table. We've been trying to get that back this summer. What's going on, folks? Welcome officially to uh, season seven, episode 51 of the Focus TV. We got Octavia Wire here, Cardo Dudley Jr., Raymond Lyons. I'm Wilson Tarpey Jr. And what you guys just got a little glimpse of was what Ray's been oh so busy with for quite a while. <laughs> Cardell and I know your pain. <laughs> Truly, no, you pain. That's it, oh, man. Great job. I'm looking forward to watching all of it. Um, look, it's titled "The Foundation." I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to talk about your work uh, before you officially like, just like, hey, it's up. Go watch it, and I don't want to see about it and think about it for a little while. Because Lord knows, it took me a while before I was like, I can see the admire documentary on my computer and not feel like ah, like get buzzed at all. Um, so, but go ahead, Ray. Just talk about the foundation a little bit. Yeah, um, just pretty much documented the um, the Jim Couch uh, DMV dominated the team through their first season in the Kennedy League. 
you know, it was something uh, Cardell and um and the Couch family work hard to put together. Uh, it's um just a combination of uh New York and uh and DMV guys, and um you know some guys they just wanted to help uh develop, like Cardell said in the, in the intro. Um, it, it was uh it was a task, um, but it you know it was interesting just to see how um how the whole thing developed over the course of the summer. Uh, you know, it, it's some it's some good tidbits and there's some some behind the scenes stuff. Um, Cardell and Coach all really really go in depth about you know what what went into forming the team and it's uh, you know it, it was a unique experience because typically a summer league team is just a bunch of guys that get together and and play some games on the weekends. This wasn't that. Uh, it was it was a purpose and a mission behind it. And um, you know I'm just excited for uh, for folks to see what what went what went into that. For sure. I can't wait to see everybody's take on it as well. Uh, Octavia heading over to the NFC East. It was trade deadline day, which was kind of, you know, anticlimactic, depending on who, you know, who you are around the league. But for your division, I can't wait to see what you think of the new people coming into your division because a certain team keeps uh, doing the thing you don't like. So, yeah, they keep adding people and they don't need anybody else at this point. Like, I literally text one of my friends that's a Commanders fan, and I just text him. I said, "I hate you," and he just laughed. He didn't even know at this point. I was just, he, I was like, "Really, Lattimore?" He's like, "Wait, what?" I said, "See, you're not even a real fan. You're not keeping up with what you guys are doing." But anyway, yes, like you said, trade deadline day. There weren't many trades that happened um, in the league as a whole, um, but there were really only two in the NFC East to to discuss, and one of them. Was for your Washington Commanders who did land cornerback uh, Marshawn Lattimore. Um, he was traded from the New Orleans Saints uh, for a premium draft pick. Um, I don't think they've actually showed exactly what round of a pick it is for. But as we know, that's one of their Achilles heels is a cornerback position. So getting a vet like him, obviously to combat playing against us in the next couple of weeks. But, you know understandable that they're going to need somebody back there um but yeah but um we'll see how it all turns out i think it'll be a good pickup for them you know uh like i said i'm sure he's happy to be out of new orleans because it's a lot of dysfunction going on down there as well um and it's crazy because they also there's been reports coming out that they said that people are now wanting to come and play for the washington commanders which I thought I would never hear my entire life. Nobody ever wanted to come here to play. Now people are like clamoring to get here to play. Um, it's just weird. I don't like it. They're becoming too much of a comparable franchise. I, I need the times. I mean, I don't feel like they need to go all the way back to like Daniel Snyder times, but like this is just a little bit much in my for my liking. But I digress. Um, but they did have a, a game this past week, another it's an uh, interdivision game. Um, it's their final game against the New York Giants. Um, so they played the New York Giants. They defeated the Giants 27 to 22. Um, on the commander side, Jane Daniels was 15 to 22, 209 yards, two touchdowns, zero sacks, eight carries for 35 yards. Um, for running back, um, surprise, surprise, Chris Rodriguez, 11 carries for 52 yards, but Austin Eckler also had 11 carries for 42 yards and one touchdown. And three receptions for 41 yards. Noah Brown coming off of his Hail Mary um, is had five receptions for 60 yards. And then Terry McClellan had two receptions for 19 yards for two touchdowns. Um, on the Giants side, I might as well just get that out too. Dan Jones was 20 of 26, 174 yards, two touchdowns, zero interceptions, and sacked twice. Seven carries, 54 yards, and one touchdown. Uh, Tyron Tracy Jr., 16 carries, 66 yards, one reception for three yards. Malik Neighbors had nine receptions for 59 yards. Theo Johnson, three receptions, 51 yards, and one touchdown. And Chris Manhurt, one reception, two yards, or one touchdown. Um, starting with the commanders, of course. Um, I mean, what 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 else do you want at this point? I I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's like I really I, I don't know. I mean, they, they scored 27 points, um, but as I always like to say, these games between teams inside the division are always weird. They're always crazy. You know, like you talk about how bad the Washington Commanders have been beating some of these other teams that they've played. The New York Giants were two and six coming into this game, all of the dysfunction that they have in there. 
But this game was still pretty close for throughout the game um, for them to only beat them by five points. Um, I think this was also the second time the second time they played them this year, of course, but both times they had issues with their with their kicker. Um, so that just didn't bode well for them as well. But yeah, Jaden Daniels is, is playing well like he's been playing. Um, but like I said, although the commander scored 27 points, the Giants dominated the time of possession, um, which is kind of weird, you know, but it is what it is. Um, as well as they played, I can see why they were looking for some defensive help as well. Um, New York ran for 140 yards in the first half um, against Washington um, up the middle. Now, they did kind of tamper it down in the second half, but I think it was mostly because by that time, the game was getting a little out of hand for the Giants. So, of course, they probably they were throwing the ball more than they were running it. Um, so that's definitely something to keep an eye on with them um, as far as their run defense. Um, yeah, but I mean, they're playing, they're playing the teams that are in front of them, of course, you know, I don't like to break that down, but I know everybody is screaming for Jaden Daniels as an MVP candidate and great the way he's been playing understandable, but I mean, and maybe I'm just biased and I'll be honest, maybe I'm a little bit biased, you know, the Philadelphia Eagles get a lot of trash and talk for, you know, the teams that they played against and nobody's really that good. I mean, really, who have the commanders played that's that great either? So, you know, let's – I looked at their schedule. Like, I think they play, like, one more team that has a winning record this year. And I think it's the Steelers and us. Whenever we play them again, we play them twice. But but I digress. This is their first year. They're doing really, really well. And, of course, you know, you kind of get a softer schedule when you weren't that great last year. But we'll see how next year goes for them or it'll be a really big test. But let's not get too far ahead. Um, but the commanders, they, they play well. Again, plays in front of you. Um, they had two fourth down conversions in the first half. Um, they're now 11 for 11 on fourth downs. I mean, that's kind of, I don't know how you do that. That's kind of amazing. Um, with the win, the commanders are now 7 and 2. This is the first time the Washington is 7 and 2 since 1996. Uh, it's a long time ago. I think I might have been eight. Uh, <laughs> but, Funny stat as well. So, like I said, 72 since 1996. Uh, since the 1996 season, which that team then collapsed and missed the playoffs, finishing nine and seven. Um, I don't think that'll happen for them, but that's just kind of weird. Um, <laughs> their defense also allowed 326 total yards, uh, which of course doesn't tell the entire story. Like I said, they kind of got gashed for the uh for the rushing in the first half, but they kind of got us together in the second half. Um uh, they were without Brian Robinson Jr. in this game, so they kind of had running backs by committee with Austin Eckler, Jeremy McNichols, and Chris Rodriguez. Of course, Rodriguez getting the bulk of the carries. Well, him and they were about the same, but he got the most rushing yards for them. Um, it's kind of nice for them to have Brian Robinson be out and still have a good rushing attempt um, and being able to still run the ball in, the, in those instances. And, of course, you always still have Jaden Daniels who's going to run the ball as well. Um, Washington finished the game with 149 rushing yards. But yeah, I mean, they played the they played the Giants. Uh, they beat the Giants. They'll have a a little bit more of a test this week coming up. Um, I'm very excited to watch that game as well. They'll play against the Steelers, who we know their defense is T.J. Watt. Um, I'm just gonna say that uh, High Smith, <laughs> Cameron Hayward. Uh, that's really gonna be a really good game. And then they've been playing well, and they'll be coming off of a bye as well. So that'll be interesting to see them. Um, on the Giants side, it's just hang it up. It's time to go. Um, I, do you know they have to travel to Germany to play the Panthers next week? Who wants to see that? I'm, I'm like, I'm not going. <laughs> I'm not going to Germany to play the Panthers for the toilet bowl in Germany. I hope nobody in Germany goes to the game because why would they do that to you guys? That's ridiculous. But I digress. Um, Daniel Jones has zero passing yards in the first half. But he threw a touchdown. These are the things that happen when you have Daniel Jones involved. I don't know how. It was the weirdest thing I ever read. Um, he's the first player in the NFL to do that since 2002. I mean, since 2000, excuse me. He was four. I saw stats differently. So they say he was either four or four or four or six for zero passing yards, also with the touchdown, which was just weird. It was his first home touchdown pass in 672 days as well. As we know, a lot of that time he was injured, but still. 
playing in Met- MetLife Stadium and going 672 days without throwing a touchdown in your home stadium is kind of crazy. But again, I digress. Um, he, <laughs> like I said, he um, he also became the first player with at least uh, since at least 1978 to have a passing touchdown and zero passing yards in the half. Um, they continue to surprise me every week. They continuously shoot themselves in the foot every week. Um, Jones was fumbled. Uh, Jones fumbled on a sack uh, by Dante Fowler. Uh, I mean, they have plenty of uh, penalties as well. Um, it, it's, it's just bad. Like, I don't even like talking about it. That's how bad it is. But I guess I have to. Um, the Giants are headed for their 10th losing season over the past 12 years. Um, that just sucks. <laughs> like, like that just sucks to be fair. Um, Malik Malik Neighbors. I mean, I guess he does. He did everything he could. He was catchless in the first half, uh, but he did finish the second half. Nine receptions for fifty nine yards. Um, but with all of that, like I said, they were still kind of in the game. That you know, I feel like Daniel Jones is trying as much as he can, but I don't just don't know if he's good enough to to do it. Um, he had a pretty good run um, for a touchdown in the game where you know he lowered his shoulder a little bit. I like. Uh, he I guess he decided to pull a what's his name? A Patrick Mahomes from last week. So yeah, he decided to lower his shoulder a little bit, and get into the end zone. Um, but it's just never enough. You're two and seven. Uh, you play the Panthers next week. You lose to the Panthers, who I mean, we just saw the Saints lose to the Panthers, and then they lost their head coach. Um, you don't want to go all the way to Germany and lose to the Panthers. I'm gonna just say that. Uh, that that'll just be terrible. Uh, next we will go to the Dallas Cowboys, who also got in the mix on trade deadline day, which is weird because they did nothing in the off season, but oh yeah, let's, let's get into this trade deadline mess though. Um, they picked up Jonathan Mingo, um, wide receiver from said Panthers. Congratulations to him to not have to travel to Germany and play against the, the giants. He got out of that kind of quickly. Um, but the Dallas Cowboys acquired wide receiver, Jonathan Mingo and a 2025 seventh round pick from the Carolina Panthers for a 2025 Fourth round pick, um, a fourth round pick for Jonathan Mingo is kind of wild. Um, I saw some stats about him, but I'm not going to go in on him like that because I feel like you still know the situation in in, in Carolina. Um, it's never been a good situation ready for anybody there, especially a younger player. Um, so I'm not going to go in on him, but the stats that I saw, they're they not good. Um, but you know, Jerry Jones is hoping that he's going to have a fresh start in Dallas. Um, but I, he's going to have a fresh start with Cooper Rush, but we'll get to that. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys, um, played against, I'm sorry, I had to put that one on here. The Atlanta Falcons, uh, they lost to the Falcons 27 to 21. Uh, Dak Prescott was 18 of 24, 133 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions, three sacks. Three carries for 30 yards. And then we also had Cooper Rush, who was 13 of 25, 115 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions, zero sacks, and one carry for four yards. Rico Dottle had 12 carries for 75 yards, five receptions for 32 yards, and one touchdown. Jake Ferguson, seven receptions, 71 yards. And Jalen Tolbert, three receptions, 19 yards, and one touchdown. I just don't understand what's going on in Dallas as a whole um, outside of just this game. Of course, I mean, Ezekiel Elliott comes back. He basically gets a healthy scratch for this game for missing team meetings. He didn't even travel to Atlanta. Um, we still playing running back carousel. Um, they elevated Dalvin Cook again. He had two carries for eight yards. I, I don't know why, but, uh, you know, Rico Dowdle did everything he could, the 12 curves for 75 yards. And I think he did pretty decent in the beginning of the game. I just don't think they gave him the ball anymore after that, when the only thing that you guys have been screaming and begging and saying that you're going to do is try to run the ball. And when I feel like you actually had a decent kind of start to run the ball, they kind of just stopped, um, which is not surprising at this point, um, but it is. And it's add insult to injury. Uh, Dak Prescott Prescott left the game with a hamstring injury, and now he is going to miss several weeks, um, which, like I said, you just picked up Jonathan Mingo for Cooper Rush to throw him the ball. I I guess that is the way, you know, Jerry feels like that they're going to go all in for the rest of the season. It's just a lot of dysfunction going on out there. I, I really don't understand what's happening. 
Um, and then to, again, adding more insult to injury, CD Lamb also had a, an AC sprain in his shoulder. Um, so he had an MRI on Monday as well as that. He looks like he should be able to play this week. Um, but they are also saying that, you know, there's a possibility that some of the other players that have been out on the defensive side due to injuries could possibly come back this week. Michael Parsons, Deron Bland. Um, I think they said they expect Ezekiel Elliott to play next week since he was just out for disciplinary reasons. Um, and then, of course, they do expect C.D. Lamb to play as well. But is it really going to be enough at this point? And, you know, and this is not me being a homer at this point. It's going to be a – it's always a crazy game, Like again, when you play in our division games because the Dallas Cowboys will play the Philadelphia Eagles this week um, in Dallas. So it's going to be a little bit crazy at that point. Um, their offensive line is just – it's just bad. <laughs> um, it's, it's bad. Uh, left tackle rookie Tyler Guyton had three false starts, uh, but it wasn't just him. Terrence still also had a false start to put them behind the chains. I mean, they said that the Falcons' pass rushing uh, is just probably at the bottom of the league. I think they came in with like three sacks on the whole year. And they doubled that and got three sacks against the Cowboys in one game. It, you know, it's tough. Like, when you don't have an offensive line, you know, it, it's real bad. Like, we talk about the running the ball. They obviously can't run the ball if the offensive line is not getting them any gaps. And then Dak Prescott, you know, he's hurting his hamstring because he's running for his life. Um, so th there is a lot to go into that as well. But it, it's just... It's getting out of control now. You know, this is going to be like the last three years, they have been 12 and five, pretty much. They're, they're already at five losses for the year. We're not, we're just not getting to the halfway point. Um, you know, you never want to say never. You know, they could possibly run the table, you know, and, and, and kind of get you, get back in the mix, especially with some of their defensive players coming back. Um, but, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better, um, especially with Dak being out now. Cooper Rush is a is affordable, formidable backup, definitely. Um, I think they said he's five in one of his starts for Dallas, but he doesn't really have that many people to throw to as well outside of CD. So it's going to be interesting for them. I'll just I'll just leave it there because I don't I don't want to harp on them too much. It's 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 just it's it's bad. Um, and last but not least, the Philadelphia Eagles uh, played this week, and they played against the Jacksonville Jaguars. They defeated the Jacksonville Jaguars 28-23. Uh, Jalen Hurts was 18 of 24, 230 yards, two touchdowns, zero interceptions, three sacks, 13 carries for 67 yards, and one touchdown. Saquon Barkley, 27 carries, 159 yards. One touchdown, three receptions for 40 yards and one touchdown. And Devontae Smith had four receptions for 87 yards and one touchdown. Um, I know everybody is talking about, of course, this backwards hurdle, which was ridiculous in live time watching it. I've never seen anything like that in my life, but I'm not going to harp on it too much because I feel like the whole sports world has done it enough for us and they will continue to do it enough for us. I love this video, though. I'm not even going to lie. Just watching everybody's faces after it happened live is always interesting. You got to watch it enough times to look at somebody different every time to see what their face looked like. And it's like, <laughs> Reed Blankenship was probably me. Um, but yeah, I, I, it, it was an amazing run. I, I know everybody's talking about the backwards hurdle, but the spin move was nasty in itself as well. So um, Saquon Barkley is a godsend for our team, <laughs> you know. He has literally been the engine for us. Uh, again, 27 carries, 159 yards, for, uh, three receptions for 40 yards, a rushing touchdown, a receiving touchdown. Um, he's already at 1,000 scrimmage yards for the year. And I think, I know he was like right second behind Derrick Henry, but I think the Ravens haven't had a bye yet. So, He's right on his heels, if not getting ready to pass him. Um, I know the other thing that everybody's talking about, of course, is the decision-making of the coaching staff. I choose to look at the positives of this because in the past, in these situations where, yes, we had a melt meltdown, they were up 22-0, to zero, um, only to win the game by five points. 
in the past, they would completely melt down and lose the game completely. So the fact that they were even able to pull it together and not lose the game, I think is a win in itself. Um, it's showing that they're at least starting to kind of reset and be able to handle it. Um, Nick Sirianni is just Nick Sirianni. Like, to me, I know a lot of people get bothered by him. He doesn't bother me. I, I feel like he's been like this the entire time, so this isn't anything new. I just think it's being heightened now because of all of the offseason drama that they had. Um, so it is what it is, but Jalen Hurts has been playing out of his mind as well. Um, no turnovers in the past four games. Um, I don't know how many total touchdowns he has, but they're just clicking on all cylinders now. The defense is finally coming together. The young boys are starting to get it together. The the Jalen Carters, the John, uh, Jordan Davises. I mean, the Kobe Dean has been playing out of his mind as a, as a linebacker. Of course, he got the interception that um, sealed the game for us. Um, Nick, I said Nick Zach Bond, um, who has never really played that position as an offense uh, as a linebacker, is playing out of his mind as well. I think he led the team with ten tackles, had like seven solo tackles. Um, they're just clicking, you know, and they have to continue this, can continually do this. And again, they're going to have to continuously do it against good teams. I know a lot of people are going to say, well, the Jaguars are two and seven; they were two and six at that point. Um, but yeah, the dots that Jalen are throwing. The acrobatic catches that are happening in this game. We finally had a Jahan Dotson sighting because I don't know why they won't throw him the ball or get him more involved, but he's going to have to eventually. Um, hopefully, Dallas Goddard gets back. Our offensive line is doing amazing as well. Um, with two people, um, Fred Johnson and no, Makai Beckton was back this week, but Makai Johnson, uh, Fred Johnson stepping in for Jordan Mailata, who probably has one more week on the uh, injured reserve and he should be able to come back. I mean, the catch Devontae Smith made, it's like two weeks in a row with acrobatic, crazy catches. Getting his feet down in bounds was even more um, exciting to watch during this catch as well. He's just really playing well. So they just really have to keep it up. They're going to play against the Cowboys this week. They have to beat them. They have to beat them in order to continue to ascend in the NFC because this is a game that, at this point, this is a game that they should win. But as we know, games in the division are always weird. So that's why they have to really lock in and win this game, especially because the following week they'll play against the Commanders on Thursday night as well. So these next two weeks are, are going to be pivotal for them. But I have faith, you know, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed, my toes crossed, um, and hope that, you know, maybe CD's shoulder just hurts a little bit too much and he just doesn't want to play. Um, maybe Jaden Daniels' ribs start to hurt again. He doesn't want to play. You know, I'm going to take my wins however I get them. I don't care who's there who's not. But – yeah, we'll see what happens next week. The man has got y'all in the tizzy in the division. Hilarious. I don't like it. Uh, hilarious. All right, ready to watch the Wizards. Things have been happening, uh, but floor is yours for those who may not have caught Wizards out. Yeah, um, they they played three times since the last time we we seen you guys. Uh, they got a win against Atlanta at home. I uh, then dropped their next two games. Uh, they played Miami and uh, in Mexico City and came back home to play the Warriors. Um, man, it, it's, you know, we, a, a lot of the talk around them this season from us is, is just going to be about, you know, development and, and taking baby steps, um, you know, which they are. Uh, one thing that stood out, uh, especially um, in regards to the Warriors game, uh, in the post game, the, Steve Kerr, uh, Steph Curry, and Draymond, they just spoke about the competitiveness of the young guys. Uh, Draymond specifically said he hasn't uh, played against a Wizards team that played that hard in years. And that's, um, you know, he, he doesn't just give that up. <laughs> you know, we know how Draymond is. He'll, if he feel a certain way, he's going to say it. So the fact that he, that he said that and acknowledged him in that way, you know, it speaks volumes. And that's, um, that's pretty much what uh what we're looking for from them man this is a, a super young team like even even the vets and the leaders are young guys you know pool and um and Kyle Kuzma like they're they're still relatively young you know and they're and they're figuring it out as they go themselves in terms of um and being in this position on the team like uh they they've been on championship teams before but you know they were they weren't the guys you know they were they were just a piece of the puzzle so um 
So being the ones that kind of uh, drive the bus, it's, it's a different experience. You know, they, they've they taken their lumps, but, um, you know, it seems to be progressing in the right direction. Uh, Jordan Poole specifically, uh, his, his play to start the season has been phenomenal uh, on both ends of the ball, which is, um, you know, which is refreshing, uh, especially um, coming off the year he had last year. He struggled uh, <laughs> fairly a lot. Uh, but, um, but yeah, man, it, 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 the young guys, man, they, they continue to impress me to be perfectly honest, the way they, the way they get after it, compete, um, just a couple of things to clean up, you know, it's always going to be, uh, those stretches where the decision-making is, is a little off. Um, but you know, that, that stuff can be corrected, but what they walk into the gym with that competitive fire, the willingness to play defense and then them learning how to play defense correctly. Um, that's, that's going to pay huge dividends. Um, you know, Bilal Koulibaly, he's pretty much a completely different player than he was last year. You know, development and uh, the leap he took over the summer, you know, getting his body together, um, being more aggressive and um, and just starting to feel like, you know, he belongs and he's one of the keys to his team. You know, it's it's reflecting in his game. Um, there's still some ways to go with him as well. I uh, still a, still a very young guy, but um. But yeah, man, the, the Warriors game, they they just really showed their youth and the Warriors showed their their, their championship experience. Um, they had some young guys too, but you know, with still having Steph Curry and Draymond Green and also Steve Kerr and the coaching staff there from those championship years, you know, it um it, it gives them an advantage. And there were some points where the Wizards had opportunities to kind of um get themselves back into the mix and take control of the game, but the Warriors turned the Wizards some of mistakes into into runs and just push their lead back out whenever the wizards threaten. So um so that's that's just a learning experience. I'm sure um Coach Keith and those guys will uh, will go over with the team and film and things like that and just kind of point out areas where they can take advantage and um and maybe down the road they win a game like this. You know, so um so yeah man they they're currently at two and four. Um you know but like we said it is it's gonna be a lot of development. And um and learning on the job this year. So um, you know, if if they if they find a way to to clean these things up, um we we're always gonna have one not shooting a lot of threes. I believe they shot 43 threes in that Warriors game. That's way too much. <laughs> uh they they got a lot of um athletic guys with size that can put the ball on the floor. You know, they need to uh, continuously put pressure on defenses and get downhill. And um and things will open up. Uh, you know the game against uh both games against Atlanta actually they're they're only two wins of the season so far. They were touching the paint and then creating good looks off penetration. Those are the threes that we want to see them take. You know not uh you know one guy kind of dribbling and just putting up a shot just because they feel like it'll coming down one pass and the three going up. But um but yeah man it's six games in. Um, Wizards fans, just take a seat, enjoy the ride. It's a, it's a lot of positive things to look forward to, and um, you know we'll we'll just continue to see what they look like for the rest of the season. They got um they got a a five game road road trip coming up, so um you know we'll we'll see how they fare, uh, you know in their first um their first lengthy road trip of the season. All right, Cardo, I'm gonna pass it to you for uh we start this week's college segment now that. College basketball is officially here. You know, we've had some exhibition, you know, exhibition slates, what have you. Yesterday, if you're on social media, you guys know it was kind of refreshing, but also overwhelming to see how many games were going on. But uh floor is yours. Yeah, man, we just going to kind of circle around, you know, some outstanding performances uh, on the first day. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say the first day of college basketball because – D2s and D3s and AIs that you go started last week. But for the most part, some haven't played yet, but for the most part. So uh, yesterday was the start of college basketball season for Division One. So uh, always got to put that put that out there. Some people think college basketball starts and ends with Division One, and, and, and that's not real. But uh, uh, the starting off with Derek Queen, man, Maryland freshman, McDonald's All-American, one hell of a debut. Uh, 22 points and 20 rebounds and 9 of 16 shooting from the field in the 79-49 win over Manhattan. Um, you know, look, it's fairly simple. He, uh, he bullied the hell out of him. Uh, footwork, his size, you know, being 6'9", 6'10". Um, 
you know, some say 250, some say 260 plus, uh, depends, <laughs> but you know, he bullied him, but he's, 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 he's always been tremendously skilled, great footwork, agile, quick. And, um, you know, with that big body of his, he, he's just a, a match of nightmare, man. He throws, a he, he has an advantage over a lot of defenders and he throws a lot of defenders off. You know what I mean? Cause, um, when you think he's about to play the power game, he goes to the fin finesse game. Um, when you think he's about to play the finesse game, he hits you with the power game, man. And he has the skill to, to finish and, uh, make plays, you know, around the basket, out on the, on the perimeter and, you know, facilitate. He's a pretty good passer as well, man. So, uh, that's one hell of a debut, man. You can't, you can't ask for much more. Uh, I call you know, when you put up 20, 20 games, that's, uh, putting up Moses Malone type number. So, uh, that's a hell of a start, man. We're going to see if he can, you know, keep on, keep it going. You know, I don't know. Obviously I don't see him averaging 20, 20 throughout the college season. Cause, uh, if that's the case, uh, you know, Cooper and Ace need to move over, and he need to be the number one pick. But uh, we're going to see if he can continue his high-level production. Uh, next up is Jonathan Lamont, former Maryland Turk, uh, North Carolina a transfer. There you go, Octavian. Clap for a change, man. Uh, 27 points, <laughs> six rebounds, and four assists on 9 to 16 from the field, 6 11 from three-point range. And the 107 55 went over Cheney University. Uh, it was good to see him kind of look like how he looked in high school. And on the AAU circuit with Team Durant, and um, you know, obviously up at St. Francis, where he was in the backcourt with, with Bob Carrington, uh, he was actually rated above Bob Carrington coming out of high school. So, it was to show you how things can change, man. You know what I mean? So, uh, but one hell of a start from him at A&T. You know, we'll obviously see what he does as they play stiffer competition, but that's what he should do. You know, sometimes it's also good to see uh, how players perform when they're playing against a team where they should dominate. Because, you know, they lax and, you know, BS, and that's a cause of concern, too. So uh, he got them boys about it there fairly quickly. Uh, next up was Quentin Mincy and Bra Max Brooks, two locals. Uh, they combined for 36 points, 18 rebounds, and seven assists in their season opening win over Riviere, uh, which has become kind of a, a, you know, annual thing up there in UMass Lowell where they play. Uh, Riviere is probably one of the top D3 programs in the nation now they up there in massachusetts so they always play one another uh it's a lot of expectations for you the world they've been knocking on the door making it to the, the conference championship the american east championship game the last couple of years and they failed in vermont vermont is vermont is just it, it's like they're the they're the young boys trying to break through and vermont is the detroit pistons they just won't let them you know and uh it's a lot of expectations for you know this this current regime and you as the well to kind of make that happen you know break through and get to the tournament um uh, so hell of a start you know quentin mincy played with us in the gym couch dmv team over the summer uh you know dominated 20 points seven rebounds three assists on six and nine from the field in 26 minutes and uh max brooks um uh, was had 16 points 11 rebounds four assists and two blocks on six and seven shooting from the field in 20 minutes so uh, that tandem up front is is is, is going is, is going to be a nightmare for any opponent. Um, look, they have they have some in the next uh, two of their next three games. They go out west. And they play some heavy hitters. Uh, they play number six Gonzaga and Gonzaga, and then they finish up at Washington before they come back to UMass Lowell. So um, I'm interested to see what they do against that caliber competition, especially with. With what Gonzaga did last night uh, against Baylor, uh, they beat the hell out of Baylor. So uh, it's, 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 it should be a fun game. Next up is Darius Maddox uh, from George Mason, 17 points and five rebounds, and a 75 58 win over North Carolina Central. Uh, you know, for George Mason, this season over, obviously impressive. You know, North Carolina Central is always competing for MEAC supremacy. They always at the top of that. Uh, so it was, it was good to see George Mason kind of. Put them away. They, they, you know, struggled at first. I was watching the game. Both teams were kind of in the defensive battle. Then, uh, you know, George Mason called, called rhythm, led by Darius Maddox. So uh, we're going to see how it goes, man. Um, they had some stiff competition in their non conference, including a trip to play Duke in December. So, uh, you know, expectations for them as well. And last but not least, Pittsburgh senior Ishmael Leggett finished with 19 points and 12 rebounds. Three assists on 69 percent shooting from the field and a 96-56 win over Radford. Uh last year he was a sixth man. 
Obviously, with both Carrington in the league, moved into the starting lineup, and uh, looks like he's ready to go. <laughs> you know, 19 as well. That's impressive all in itself. You had a three assists, and then obviously shooting down near 70 percent from the field. I mean, I mean, what coach can be mad at that, man? So, uh, you know, they dominated, did what they had to do on their home court. Uh, looking forward to see how it continues moving forward. All right. Uh, on to things in College Park, although they weren't at home to open their season. Uh, they play UNBC Monday night at Chesapeake Employers Insurance Arena. Uh, Maryland opened officially opened their season with a 74-32 win. Uh, Christina Dolce uh, had a double-double in her official Terrapin debut. Um, again, Maryland's it's 10 new players. Talk to you. I, you know, shared that with you guys a couple weeks ago. Um, but she had 13 points and rebounds. Shy Sellers, you know, she's been there through a lot. Uh, had a normal Shy Sellers game, did a little bit of everything 12 points, seven boards, two assists. Uh, Allie Kubek continued her, you know, how she finished last year 11 points and eight boards. Uh, Maryland led by 11 at the break. And then in the second half, which we saw a kind of glimpse of this, glimpses of this in the exhibition slate, um, they just locked up. They gave up. 10 points in the second half, um, you know, 10 points in two quarters is 10 points in two quarters. Uh, def- you know, outstanding defense being played is going to go a long way, uh, no matter men's basketball, women's basketball, what have you. As the year goes on, especially, um, you know, we got so many new pieces, what have you. Uh, defense can carry you a very long way later in the year if it's something you can uh, hang your hat on. Obviously, just beginning the things. Um, but it's good to see that kind of carry over for this group. Um We've seen several iterations of Maryland over the last couple of years where they just haven't had the depth in the front court and or the size. This isn't one of those teams um, at this point. At least this is what it looks like. Um, you know, up next, they host Coppin State ex, uh, ex, at the Xfinity Center on Thursday. And then, you know, they'll be hosting Duke. Kind of a throwback little ACC vibes, which would be fun because, um, you know, we we haven't had that in forever. Shout out to uh, Brandon and Maryland for routinely – the non-conference schedule that they have every year is usually absurd. There's some heavy hitters on there. Um, and it's great to have the kind of that old school ACC vibe back. I'm looking forward to being at Xfinity Center on a Sunday for that. Ho- hopefully people come out and fill it out. Cause you know, if you guys come out, who knows, maybe they make it a regular thing. Cardell's been in the building with me at times, you know, for UConn coming out here, South Carolina coming out here. Yo, it's a fun atmosphere. Bring your butts outside, fill the seats, and we can have Maryland Duke, even though they kill the conferences or what have you. You know what I'm saying? Like, just come Josh, on. Josh, ducking that wreck, man. He ain't trying to come to College Park and go through with Coach David. <laughs> ducking that wreck. Hey, man. Uh, neither here nor there. But we're checking with you guys next week with the college shape. You're looking forward to it. Uh, Cardo, what you got for us, uh, whether it's taking a leave it or a rapid fire? Man, we gonna go to rabbit fire. A lot of drama in the, in the association. Good lord, man. God yeah. damn. Uh, Joe M. B. has been suspended for three games without pay for shoving Philadelphia Inquirer columnist Marcus Hayes after Saturday, Saturday's loss to the Memphis Grizzlies. The NBA announced on Tuesday, "quote Mutual respect is paramount to the relationship between players and media in the NBA." Joe Dumas, the NBA's executive vice president of basketball operations, said in a statement announcing the suspension. While we understand Joel was offended by the personal nature of the original version of the reporter's column, interactions must remain professional both sides and can never turn physical. Uh, the incident took place Saturday night and came in uh, reaction to MB taking issue with the recent column by Hayes that mentioned MB's son and late brother, both named Arthur, while questioning MB's professionalism and effort to stay in shape. After shouting at Hayes during an exchange of words, MB shoved the columnist. Uh, Octavia, your thoughts on not just the suspension, but the whole incident, you know, from it be stepping to the reporter. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> it's a, like you said, it's a lot going on in the association for somebody who hasn't even touched the, the floor yet. Um, and we're almost two weeks deep into the season, it's kind of crazy. While on one side, I do understand, you know, you can kind of get a little bit in your feelings when people mention your family, especially a deceased family member in any capacity, especially especially the scrutiny he's been under the last couple of days and last couple of weeks with the comments about him saying he's not doing back to backs. And then, you know, the thing he said about as much as I've done for this city and everybody in Philadelphia wondering what he's done for this city. Um, 
I understand things get a little bit testy, but I, I agree with Joe Dumars that, you know, at the end of the day, you still can't turn things physical. You know, you, you got to have a little bit of restraint when it comes to that aspect of it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering the three games that he suspended for if he was going to play anyway, but I understand he still would have got paid. So I digress, but I, I see both sides of it. I hate it. I don't think that, you know, it should turn physical in any aspect of it. But, I mean, a lot of these players are a little sensitive, too, as well. So, I mean, we all got to be just cognizant of the things that we say to each other as human beings, regardless if you're a player, regardless if you're a reporter. Um, I didn't read the actual comment, so I'm not 100% sure exactly how they were said and how they landed. So maybe that would change my thought process depending on that. But it's just unfortunate. It's a bad look for the league. It's a bad look for Embiid, especially, like I said, under the scrutiny he's been under. Um, yeah, it's just bad all the way around. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, the the um, the article was – he, he shouldn't have wrote that. He could have got his point across without mentioning the um, the family members. Um, and B's got to control himself. That's unacceptable. Uh, and he's got to own up to the reason why we're here in the first place. So, I mean, I, I get it. You know, I don't I don't agree with what was um, what was written either. But I, I think he was just look, looking for. A, somebody to to um you know to take his frustration out on because of because of the other stuff which is self-inflicted if if we're being 100 percent honest um but yeah the, all that stuff about everything he does for the city and all this other stuff like dude when you when are you going to take some when you're going to take some ownership of of the reason you're portrayed the way you are that's that's just where I'm at with it. Um, but like I tell you, said it's um, I, I see both sides of it. Um, he, I feel he definitely had a reason to be um, to be upset and frustrated. Uh, it's a way to confront a reporter. I mean, or or get your point across in that way, without getting physical. Um, like we're we're looking at these two pictures. I mean, what do you what do you gain by physically approaching this man? You're seven feet damn it 300 pounds like get a grip um but yeah uh but he he's gotta he's gotta do his part to to make sure that this stuff can't be said about him regardless because it's been proven that he would have took offense to the criticism regardless whether his family was mentioned or not and aside from the family being mentioned in the in the article the criticism was was legitimate so i don't know man then again to octavia's point like i don't think and be tripping off missing three games and with that contract he on i don't think he tripping off missing pay for three days neither so i mean he won he got to throw a temper tantrum and and put his hands on somebody and look like he was you know proving whatever point he was trying to prove and he gets to miss some more games so Kudos to him. He he came out on top. What was said was uh, Joe B consistently points to the birth of his son Arthur as the major inflection point in his basketball career. Hayes wrote to begin the original version of the column. He often says that he wants to be great to leave a legacy for the boy named after his little brother who tragically died in an automobile accident when B was in his first year as a 76er. Well, in order to be great at your job, you first have to show up for work. And B has been great at just the opposite. So, uh, and then Hayes posted on Twitter that uh, his story had been altered and that he understood why so many people were upset about it. Um, the odd, yeah, so that's, that's the reason why, that's what happened. Um, uh, Wilson, your thoughts on it? If you take out the personal, the personal parts of it, everything's warranted from a basketball standpoint. Like Joel, you brought all that on you. Uh, the personal parts of it, uh, 
Mr. Hayes is tripping. Didn't need to have that in there. The editor, I don't even know why you let that, like, that's the two of you. However, if Hayes, if you want to say that's not on you, whatever, I know, you know, editors are separate entities, what have you. But the two of you, there was no reason to have that in there. And then the other side of it is, I'm old, and this is a what? It's a this many years for Philly media to kind of even remotely get at you, really. And that's not me justifying this for you know I, 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 as well, but uh, yeah, the personal parts unnecessary uh, from Hayes and uh, the editor, but everything else, like Joel, you can't complain about anything else. Like anything else, that's right. We've been talking about you. they've been waiting for you to get in shape since you've been drafted. Like that's on you, dude. You you wind your way to an MVP, you know, like you whining about it. Why dot 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 dot? We can we can look at Joker, we can call him whatever you want to call him. He is routinely on that court. Outside of when he's with his horses, he's on that court when he's supposed to be. Look, man, like there's some conversation you've played your way is you're you've played yourself out of. And those are things you need to own, uh, own and um have to just settle with. But yeah, that's just kind of where I'm at with. It. Yeah, I, obviously MB cross the line, you can't go show a reporter, but family is off limits. Family is off limits. They got nothing to do with what a, a player is doing on the court. Uh you, you leave that alone, man. Like, like me personally, I don't play wife and kids. I don't play those games. You know, it's it's gonna lead to one situation, and I'm not talking about fighting either. You know what I mean? You you got to go. Like, I'm I'm, I'm ready to take it there. This is unnecessary. Um, you got a problem with me? Deal with me as a man. Uh, look, talking about his basketball, that's fair game and it's warranted. Uh, the reason why he, I see what you're saying, Wilson, the reason why he's always got a pass because there's been other whooping boys that they can focus their attention on. Markel Folks, Ben Simmons, Doc Rivers, Tobias Harris, James Harden. There's always been other people to focus on, and as long as he put them numbers for the most part, it's cool. But now it's him. Because Maxi out there hooping. Like, Every time we turn around, you can't, you're not here. We're tired of this. And this is also reflective of where we are as a society. It's a little bit, it's softer. I mean, we can say that compared to how we were growing up. Because the Philly that we knew and love, or well, not even say love, but the Philly we knew that Charles Barkley and Allen Iverson played, you know, they was playing with, I had to deal with, it would have been a different ball game. It would have been a different. <laughs> It would have been a different ball game, especially, you know, he's kind of the first superstar since Allen Iverson. What did Allen Iverson always do? The boy played through like 50 injuries a game and was still killing dudes. So a blue-collar city ain't rolling with how much he getting paid, all that money, and you ain't showing up for work. Meanwhile, everybody else barely making ends meet, and they working double shift and can't afford to miss a day. You're not going to, dog, ain't nobody trying to hear me and their after complain about this and that, bro. The homie doing the, 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 the laborer and all that, yo, my whole body hurts every night, but every day. But I got to go work this double because I got to feed my family. I don't want to hear that. So if I if I manage to scrape up enough money to take my kids to come see you and you don't play, oh, hell yeah, I got a problem with you. Unless the six is going to refund the money, which they're not. So you gotta show up and play, man. So I get it. Look, he, he crossed a line. Leave the family out of, it. especially one, one member of the family that, that's not even here anymore. Like, what's the point? Like that's 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 sick, man. Like that's sick, man. And he lucky is Embiid, and, and, and Embiid just all he got was a, a, a shove. Cause I remember um, back in the day when King Mar wrote up on Mark Cuban. He wrote up on the owner. Cause Mark Cuban said something about his mom. And Mark Cuban made a beeline on the other side of the court. <laughs> and the cameras was following everything. And came out like, yeah, you better keep walking. Mark Cuban wasn't talking. He was, yeah, I, okay, yeah. He, it was, leave family alone, man. Leave family alone. Especially in the world, John, where 
this this social media world we live in, man. You say one thing about the family, and the family now and they getting on the IG, and they got strangers coming at them. They like, what the hell is going on? Leave family alone, man. And, and that should be a rule for all me. Leave it alone. It has nothing to do with nothing. Um, and, and, and that's just what it is. Uh, we're gonna move forward. Uh, we're gonna go to the NFL side of things. Uh, not only did the Steelers land Jets wide receiver Mike Williams in exchange for a 2025 fifth round pick, but the team made another deadline move and acquired Packers pass rusher Preston Smith for a 2025 seventh round selection Tuesday. And Williams, the Steelers added a complimentary player to top wide out George Pickens, who has been a focal point of defenses since the team traded Deontay Johnson to the Panthers for cornerback Dante Jackson in the offseason. And by trading for Smith, the Steelers bolstered the position group that has dealt with a number of injuries this season with the 10-year veteran who has been a consistent starter for two organizations over the past nine seasons. Um, Smith, who has two and a half sacks and 19 tackles this season, will also help the Steelers run defense as the teams enter a pivotal stretch of AFC North play. Ray, we're going to start with you. Uh, how do these acquisitions help the Steelers' chances in the AFC? Um, I mean, yeah, it, it addresses some needs that they have. And, uh, I mean, I don't know why people continue to give Mike Tomlin things that he needs. But, um, you know, it, it is what it is, man. And, uh, I mean, he, he was doing – we we seen him do much better with with worse. So – I think it 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 um it definitely gives them a, a shot in the arm for the rest of the season. Um, you know, Mike Mike Tomlin is just a winning coach, and yeah, man, I expect them to continue to win with these additions. Wilson. Uh, yeah, man. Every time I think about Mike Tomlin, the Steelers think about like Iron Man one when dude was like, "Man, how come you can't build the arc reactor?" Tony built it in a cave. And dude's like, well, I'm not Tony Stark. Right. Leave Mike Tomlin alone. This man just, he refuses to have losing seasons with nothing. It's him, TJ Watt. Bro, you still as fans can't name everyone on their roster. And yeah, I'm sorry. I know y'all are a great fan base, but no, the hell you can't. All right, you can't. You really, truly can't. Y'all can't tell me you start a secondary because nobody knows. Is Joey Porter and Kid and them? You don't know. We know TJ's out there, but again, y'all see what's going on in the AFC, right? <laughs> Lamar got some things finally, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Kermit and, and his Kermit and Fat Man over there doing what they doing. They let DeAndre Hopkins get over there. Y'all lost your mind. He ain't having adult virus. Actually, oh, I'm. Okay, I'm going to say it. This is his first adult wide receiver since Patrick been in. He's never had an adult wide receiver like this. Who's going to be where he's supposed to be all the time, every time. Who's going to adjust mid-route. Like, y'all gave him, you know how Travis Kelsey doesn't have routes. He just does whatever the defense gives him. Y'all just gave, that's what y'all gave him, DeAndre Hopkins. Now you got two dudes out there just playing. Yeah, I'm running this. Yeah, I see that too. Congratulations, guys. Let's make everything extra difficult. Spags over there pretty much reading people's breaking protection rules. Like, yeah, if you're the Steelers. Yes, you need bodies to go chase those two quarterbacks. Load up. And also, Mike Williams, um, I know he has to be so happy he got away from that. <laughs> he suffered from this thing called I'm not Devontae Adams. So now he doesn't get he doesn't have to worry about that. <laughs> it's not your fault anymore. Um and also, like that's a, that's one of the type of wide receivers, you know. I'm sure Russ gonna be happy with, and it and it gives some it gives the Steelers something to take a little bit of pressure off Pickens. And you know, Pickens is a wild dude, anyways. This is another thing where is an adult at the wide receiver position for Russ over there because it's been, you know, they just you got George who's insanely talented, but you know, y'all see what George Pickens be on. You, you never know what's about to happen when. Um, so I just think it was it's two good moves and moves that people didn't spend enough t- time talking about. Just like when they're quiet about the Chiefs getting help and Lamar getting Deontay Johnson, they had the Zay Flowers. Like, what y'all doing, man? Like, all y'all quiet worried about the wrong things. But, you know, go Steelers, I guess. Lamar should be a Bronco. Go ahead, Octavian. 
I mean, I think y'all kind of summed it up perfectly. Like you said, first of all, like you said, I don't know why they keep giving Mike Tomlin things that he needs. That's like the truest statement I've heard all day because it's effing Mike Tomlin at this point. Like, I mean, everybody thought Russell Wilson was dead before the season started, <laughs> but obviously he still remembers how to play football. Um, so I, it's definitely a great pickup. Like you said, you definitely going to need more bodies because the AFC is AFC. It's a lot going on over there as well. Um, I feel like the AFC is always like, of course, the more premier between the conferences, uh, but they, they really own one. Uh, they really own one now because it's even that, but a lot of the teams are even like really bunched together too. So it's like, you really don't know who's going to do what, what day it kind of gets a little bit wild. So yeah, if you're in the AFC, you definitely need to like, get it together i mean the jets i mean i i feel like no don't get me wrong i know it was mike williams to them but again you're giving mike williams to an afc opponent that possibly could really use him and i think they sometimes forget that mike williams was actually kind of good before he tore his acl so um if he gets to a place where he probably really feels a lot more comfortable and I'm telling him what he can really do. And like you said, take some pressure off of George Pickens. Uh, take some pressure off of the run game so Najee can continue to play well as well as Jalen Warren. Um, and then, like you said, Preston Smith is, you know, he's probably happy to be. I mean, I don't know if he's happy to be out of Green Bay. Green Bay's doing pretty okay. Um, but to go play for Mike Tomlin, like, that's always amazing. So I think it's a great pickup for them. Um, it keeps them in the mix of what's going on because, Lo and behold, you know, they're about to time them the way to another winning season, it looks like. So this just helps them possibly try to progress a little bit more into the playoff um, because I think that's the last thing that they've been missing over the last couple of years. I'm uh, going to just keep it moving. AFC (laughs) stuff got me depressed. Uh, Last question. I mean, um, yeah, we're going to go back to the NBA side of things. in the interview with the Athletics, Doug Harlan, Durant opened up about one loud critic who has been more vocal about the Phoenix Suns and Durant this season, uh, ESPN Stephen A. Smith. Uh, Durant commented on Twitter, from, on Twitter on a video of Smith questioning Durant's leadership on the Suns this season. Uh, it sounds like Durant is still heated by the discourse as he called Smith a clown in the interview. Quote, yeah, Stephen A., I don't understand how people even listen to Stephen A., I've been in the league for 18 years. I've never seen Stephen A at a practice or a film session or a shoot around. I've never seen him anywhere but on TV talking ish about players. He's a clown to me. He's always been a clown. You can write that too. Uh, Durant admitted he knows he has things to work on, but he also doesn't think uh, figures like Smith who aren't physically watching him practice at least should speak up about it. Well, of course, I got things I need to work on. But added that talking about the leadership stuff is stuff that's like so vague and, sub- and subjective. Wilson, um, thoughts on this back and forth that has been going on between Mr. Durant and Stephen A for years? They both just need to leave each other alone. Um, At this point, just please stop. It's not even a fun little, like, back and forth. Um, And the other thing with Stephen A, like, man, I ain't even trying to. Bro, you in the studio all day, dude. All day. Like, all day, man. This ain't the... This ain't pre-TVU. You know what I'm saying? I think it's a totally different thing. Pre-TVU. But this is post-TVU. Please just stop, man. Like, just... Everything, like, with... with, with I feel like everything with him, with, like, some of the other old dudes, like... This stuff's there. We got a couple more years of these dudes left. Can we just please shut the hell up and just let them play their last years out? Whatever happens, happens. It's please, pretty please. I'll tell you. Yeah, I'm tired of it too. Um, to be fair for both of them, because I feel like both of them get into it with not just each other, but other people within the league and within entertainment or whatever you want to say. I feel like both of them are sensitive in, in this aspect, Kevin in his situation, Stephen A, of course, in his situation as well. Um, but like you said, like, I wish they was just, like, stop talking about it. Like, 
like I feel like like Stephen A is gonna do what Stephen A does. Like there's there's talking about it is only gonna bring more light to it and only gonna shine more of a you know a light on what he is talking about. So to me at this point, like get on your burner page, KD, and just sweet it out, get your feelings out, and, and move on because like he's not gonna change. He's on a, a million dollar TV show. You think he's going to change because you got an attitude about what he says about you? He's not. And he, there's always going to be somebody saying something. Like, it just is. And unless you really got those burner account and you really want to address each and every one of them <laughs> one by one, it's it's a waste of your time. It's a waste of your, your everything. Like, I wouldn't even waste my time worrying about this. Like, like you said, you've been in the league for 18 years. You say he ain't been in your practice, he ain't seen you play. You ain't got to go back and forth with him about that in, in the media or, you know, it just it just seems stupid on both sides. You know, people, he got to say something and then now he got to respond back and now he got to, it's exhausting. Just let's, let's focus on the fact that the Phoenix Suns are playing well so far this year. Let's, let's focus on that. Ray, close it out. <laughs> Yeah, man. Now it, it it's just nothing to gain from engaging with uh Stephen A in that manner. Uh first of all, you're never gonna beat the man with the mic. He talks for a living. That's all he does. Um and and like at this and the the frustrating part about it is like Kevin Durant knows his game plan. So why why even engage? Like he's called him out on it several times. Like he know he knows what he's gonna do, so just just leave that alone and let that man talk into the echo chamber. Um, like Octavia said, it's not gonna change. He's not gonna stop. Uh, and for for Stephen A, like it, it's it's sad to see what he's evolved into because he knows better because he came up in a time where you had to be a real journalist and not this sensationalist crap that they do today so i mean i i get it he he makes a whole lot of money but i mean you now you've cheapened the profession so thank yourself for the state of things today um but yeah man like katie's well within his rights to respond if he wants to but it, it's it's an exercise in futility man just focus on the job man and go out Play the best basketball that you possibly can. Try to win the championship and just <laughs> enjoy your career at this point, man. It is like y'all said, man. You've been in the league for 18 years. That's that's a long time. Don't stress yourself at this point over inconsequential stuff like that. Like you know, you know who you are as a player, or at least I hope you do. So, like, why continue to try to? explain yourself or prove yourself to somebody in that position uh yeah my my two cents is Durant is averaging 27 and six and three um 54 from the field 43 from three-point range and 82 from the line he had a few more free throws that's 50 40 90 again which is damn near impossible to do one time <laughs> In his 18th season you see what i'm saying and oh yeah they're six and one on the season right now your leadership speaks for itself we we all know you're the best player on the suns um stephen age is looking for a headline you just gave him one he, he baited you and you fell for it keeping that stuff alive that's what he does um it, it's just I, I, in a sense, I'm glad he said it because I've been saying it for years. I'm like, a lot of these personalities that people listen to, I've always said, like, bro, they're not at the games. I know they're not at the games. They're in a studio somewhere across the country just talking. And I know they're not watching all these teams on TV. They, no, they're not. They're watching box scores and highlights, and then they just go in there and get to talking. Because if they were watching the games, they wouldn't be saying the things that they're saying. You see what I'm saying? So... Like, for instance, I guarantee you if Stephen A was to talk about the Wizards tomorrow, he would be like, they're an atrocity, they're trash, and he would just go there. But if you're watching the games, you know, like, they're just young, but they're coming. 
They just got to figure out how to put, you know, finish games off. But they're coming. They're, they're competitive. They don't go away, which is a good sign. And they have young talent, which is also a good sign. Most teams in the league don't have either. It's just above, like, it's like, in a sense, in some fashion, it's like Kevin gets more sensitive as he get older. But as you get older, you're supposed to just be on more on your grown man. Just like, that stuff just, I don't even hear you. Let alone be bothered by you. You see what I'm saying? It's just it's just a no-win situation because that's what they need. And now he's going to milk this. I saw Stephen A in this reply uh, with a backhanded statement trying to acknowledge, I hope you get out the first round. But that only makes sense because he got two championships. And as much as I, I get it, the Steph team and all that, but Kevin was leading the way in those finals. Trust me. He was the guy. They got behind him. So it's just, I, I mean, I hate seeing it, man, because it, it's just, I know he's smarter than that. I know he's better than that, man. And, and it hasn't ever gone well. Now, if it's a reporter that's going, like, uh, what was that? Somebody wrote a book on the Golden State. It was one reporter when he was in Golden State that kept coming at him or something Ethan like that. Strauss. He, yeah, he called him an idiot, something like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. I feel like that's fair game. But like Stephen, when you know, or you know, or like when Skip was still on, he still mattered. Man, lead that alone, just who, man? Because something, because you don't need to be raw, raw to be a great leader. Some dudes just do that, and it's just loud talk. It's like, man, shut the hell up. You ain't, you ain't even back know what you say. He leads by example. That's leadership. Because you can't ever point to him. We know he put in the work. So, um. At this point, I don't see either changing, but for, for the sake of him, I just, I'm talking about Kevin, just ignore that, man. Because it's going to become a distraction at the worst point as your season progress, and you and it's going to come back up. Somebody's going to say something else, and then it's going to be a bad distraction when you least need it. Like in a playoff war or something like that, now you answer this, you're dealing with this headache, and that distraction can be costly. So, you know, just don't take the day, man. It's not even worth it. Everybody's hip to what Stephen A does, man, and what he's about, so... You know, just just keep hooping. That's all you can do right there. Yeah, man. The saddest part is they just looking for topics because it's stale. It's just too much that I don't know. <laughs> Figure out what the hell's actually going on in the sport. If you yep. took if you just took it, you know, maybe tried to do your job, you know, once upon a time. You see, like you said, uh Oklahoma City seven and oh. Phoenix and Golden State are six and one. The West is a jumbled up mess to, out the gate. Mm-hmm. Bruh. The two teams, everybody, like nobody was talking about Phoenix. Nobody cared about Phoenix after that last year. And then nobody cared about Golden State. Them folks just came off the, you know, their two leaders came off the Olympics. And where are the teams at right now? Okay, cool. What, 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 what are we talking about? We, we look out uh, east. Carla, uh, you were talking about, I uh, think, Cleveland the other day. But the freaking undefeated Ooh. out Ooh. the gate. There's so many Ooh. stories that can be talked about. And that's the, that's the most disheartening part about it is – you shouldn't have to be ser- like. Do you know how much stuff you got to ignore to search for this crap? <laughs> <laughs> like you had to skip past six great stories or talking points to get to oh, same old. Where's my favorite? Kevin Durant's a bad leader, bro. We've had so many players talk about watching him work out or whatever generation or it's, or it's life changing, what have you. Like he said, Carter, that's literally leadership. What can you say about somebody? Go, you watch them work. You like, damn, I ain't working hard enough. Hey, dog, man, that's leadership. But again, as I say, you said, I too shall digress. We will see y'all next week. Appreciate y'all as always. Don't forget to check out uh, Wizards Outlook later this week. And on Ray, uh, Ray, let everybody know your YouTube channel. Um, start tomorrow where they can see the foundation. Yeah, on YouTube, it's just uh, at Lions Den Sports. It'll be up uh, tomorrow morning. All right, folks, please go check that out. Um, you know, we, we, we really want you to check that out. It was a whole lot of good content from that. And uh, we'll see y'all next week.